Intermission is over. Get your popcorn. Come back now for the second part. I'm just kidding. There's no popcorn. But there the sure were some good snacks down there, weren't there? That was wonderful. Praise God. Now, we'll be doing that on all three of these nights, and uh, that is wonderful. So as you're starting to come in, I just want to say I'm glad that you're here. Hope that we can have some more come. Give, uh, give somebody a call. Give somebody a, a jingle and say, hey, I missed you last night. We really had a wonderful time. Did you get a blessing from Brother Lang's message? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful, the technology we have, that we can great. hear a message from across in Africa, right here in our church, and that is a blessing. These will be uploaded, if you didn't uh, get to see that in the first part, it will be uploaded tonight. Give it a few hours, it'll happen after church tonight. All right, as we begin our uh, second service, we have a special number by Heather, Peru. And so if you'll give her your attention, and then uh, we will turn it over to our evangelist immediately after that. God bless you, Heather.
Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Heather. Just wanted to remind you that the theme for our Revival Missions Conference is a willing heart, if you have noticed that on the uh, new banner up there. We're just going to keep that up there the rest of the year because that's going to be kind of a the part of the theme for our whole uh, Faith Promise Missions push. And so we'll be talking about that from that perspective of a willing heart. We have so much to be thankful for with uh, uh, Taylor's salvation yesterday after the morning service. Amen. If you didn't hear about that, uh, young lady uh, got saved after church, praise God, uh, under conviction from the preaching. And uh, we're so glad she got saved. And, and of course, we're so thankful for the news today. But Brother Jeff, come on up here and deliver the word. We thought the rapture happened for a minute because you were the only one gone and we were all still in here. <laughs> then we realized you were maybe still I, here. Maybe I better preach on assurance of salvation. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, find the gospel of Luke, if you will. And I just realized I left something in the pew here. Left behind. I was left you behind, I guess. All right. So a couple of the books that are on the table in the back, one of them is entitled God's Forever Word. And this is a book dealing with the subject of the inspiration and preservation of scripture, a very important uh, subject uh, in our day and age, a very important subject for believers to understand. And I deal with it from uh, a, a different standpoint than many authors that are covering this subject. And I'm not saying that to criticize them. I'm saying that I dealt with it from a different angle because I didn't see the sense of rewriting what other people have already written. So if you want a good resource on the subject of the inspiration and preservation of Scripture uh, in the authorized version that we use, also called the King James Version, I believe this would be a good resource for you. I believe it will help you. And then there's a new book back there that was not out when I was here three years ago. It's entitled Young Heroes. <coughs> and this book has over 40 <coughs> chapters, and it deals with young people in the Bible mm -hmm. who did something important, something significant for God before they reached the age of 20. <coughs> and it's an encouraging book for young people themselves. It's an encouraging book for the parents of young people. And uh, some of these uh, characters in here are very familiar to us. Uh, some of them, you might have said, wow, I've read the Bible and I don't remember this guy. Uh, but uh, God helped me over the years of study to comb through the scripture and find a number of people who have <clears throat> served the Lord and done something important for God uh, before they were 20 years old. And so those two books are back there. Let me uh, put in my pitch for faith promise. Now, Pastor Tyson did not ask me to do this. Pastor Tyson did not even know I was going to, but I'm gonna take a liberty as a visiting speaker to give my own testimony. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, when I was saved, I enrolled at Tennessee Temple College. That is where your pastor and I met each other. And uh, I, uh, got involved in the church there, Highland Park Baptist Church, and right away in the fall, there was something called a missions conference. And missionaries from all over the world, Highland Park Baptist Church supported hundreds of missionaries. Their missions budget would blow your mind. It was just an unbelievable missions budget. And uh, they did something called Faith Promise. They encouraged people to get along with God and say, Lord, this next year, I wanna give X amount of money to missions. And I'm asking you to help me do that mm -hmm. by faith. Because you don't know if you're going to get sick. You don't know if you're going to lose your job, whatever. And so you just ask God. And you know what I did? I started off with a small gift every week. And I just kept building it. And I can tell you that this preacher's never missed a meal except the meals he wanted to miss. And I can tell you that our electric bill has been paid every month. I can tell you that our cars have run and our health has held up. I can tell you that many, many financial needs have been met over the years. And I've never missed the money that I give when I'm tithing. 
and I've never missed the money that I give above the tithe in what I call a faith promise, where I say, Lord, I'm going to give this to you. This is what I'm going to give to you for the cause of missions. Because around the world tonight, there are people who would consider our hardships the easiest day of their life. Yeah. And one of the things that I find interesting is when you give to missionaries, you realize you're giving to the poor. It's true. Think about that. As you read the Bible, what does God have to say about the poor? He has a very special love for those who are truly poor. I'm not talking about these people that stand on a street corner and pilfer drivers that are driving by. I'm talking about people with a true need, a real need, people who work for pennies a day, people who hardly have any food, people like the believers in Myanmar and the believers in, in India and the believers in some of these persecuted countries, whether they're Hindu or Muslim or, or Buddhist or whatever, and these people are literally living from from mouth to mouthful to mouthful, they're barely surviving. And when you give money to the missionaries who are serving in those places, those missionaries are able to help those people and give them the gospel. And you would be, I, I believe, overjoyed to know that you could give us what would co be considered a small amount of money mm -hmm. in the United States economy that could do absolutely amazing things on the foreign field. And someday, <clears throat> we're going to be in heaven. Amen? Amen? Amen. Oh, I want to be sure you're all here. <laughs> someday, we're going to be in heaven. Amen. And around the throne of God, if you read Revelation 5, there is a multitude from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. And some of those people that are there are going to be there because missionaries reached them Amen. in their <clears throat> faraway places. And I want to, I, I really do, I want to encourage you to go out and I want you to grab one of these and I want you to look at the amounts on the back. I guess these are weekly. Uh, it says weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. You can check whichever box you want. And you know what? Start with a dollar, start with 5, 10, 25, 50, 75, 100, 200, 300, or other. Now, other means 1,000 or 2,000. <laughs> now, when I was a pastor, I did this every year. And I just said, look, you decide what God wants you to give. And if God wants you to give it, you think he'll supply it? Amen. Yeah, he sure will. You pray. You focus, if you're married, you talk it over with your husband or wife. If you're a widow, maybe you wanna talk it over with your pastor. I don't know, but you know what? You must talk it over with Jesus. And put down there and say, Lord, I'm gonna trust you to help me do this Amen. in 2023. I guarantee you're gonna see some great things while you're on earth. But when we get to heaven, we're gonna see what it really did. I'm excited about that. Luke chapter 4 tonight. Luke chapter 4. And we'll read verses 14 and following. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 and following. <clears throat> and Jesus returned, that is, returned from the wilderness where he had been tempted of the devil. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue. I, I like that, that was his habit. Jesus had a habit of going to public worship, amen? That's a, that's a good habit to have. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew name Isaiah. 
And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Wow. Our text tonight is verse 18. Verse 18 and 19 are a citation of Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2. If you want to put the Old Testament reference down there, you can so you know where to find that in the Old Testament. But he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then you're going to notice that Jesus here identifies in five phrases, five groups of people to whom he came to minister. And I like it because three of them already begin with a B, the letter B as in boy. And I am a great alliterator. I like alliterated outlines. And the other two are simple to outline that way. Jesus came to minister to the bankrupt, the brokenhearted, mm. the bound, the blind, and the bruised. That's good. The bankrupt, the brokenhearted, the bound, the blind, and the bruised. And he said to his disciples, as my father has sent me, finish it with me, so send I you. So just like the Father sent Jesus into the world, and we heard on the uh, video tonight from the missionary over in, uh, in Nigeria, we heard him say that, that he was sent there. We heard him say that, uh, that he uh, sensed the call of God upon his life. And we heard him talk about going for, uh, going for us or going for them, but really going for Jesus. And how he mentioned that Jesus... Will Jesus came to do the Father's will. And just like the Father sent Jesus, he has sent us. You say, was well, this missionary conference or is this revival? It's both. Amen. These two topics are so woven together, you cannot preach missions to an unrevived congregation mm -hmm. and get anywhere. <coughs> and if you That's preach good. revival and people are revived, they will be excited about missions. And so I want to give this to us tonight in this way. And I want us to see how Jesus came to minister to these people and how they really are five groups of people, but they're in two separate columns. Mm. There's the lost column. And we're going to look at some of them in the Bible. There are lost people who are bankrupt and brokenhearted and bound and blind, and bruised. But the other column is the saved column. And you know what? There are some saved people that are bankrupt, mm -hmm. and brokenhearted, and bound, and blind, and bruised. We're going to look at them tonight, because I believe there's a ministry for every person. And the ministry that we have is not just to the uttermost part of the earth like we saw in this video. The ministry that we have is not, okay, I put my $50 in every week. I put it in every week. I put it in every week. And, and we are, we're accustomed in the United States of America to throwing money at things. Mm -hmm. yeah, we are. Because we're too busy to do things. Okay. And I want you to understand that the Great Commission in, in the book of Acts is outlined specifically, Mark says, go ye into all the world, all the world. Not just the far away places, all the world. Mm -hmm. But in the book of Acts, you shall be witnesses unto me. Where? In Jerusalem. And in Judea. And in Samaria. And to the uttermost part. 
This is often, a missions conference is often about the uttermost part, and we don't say as much about the rest of it. And I just want to give you a little, uh, a simple breakdown before we get into this outline tonight. <clears throat> the, the Jerusalem of, of Camp Lake Baptist Church is Sparta and the surrounding towns, right here close by. And the person that God has called and placed here to reach this Jerusalem is a man by the name of Dennis Tyson. This is his circle. He drew a circle here and he put himself in the middle of it. And this is the place where God has put him. Now, how many of you actually live in Sparta? Let me see your hands. Okay, but not everybody. And I guarantee if we had the Sunday morning crowd here, or even last night's Sunday night crowd, there would have been a whole lot more that do not live in Sparta. Mm -hmm. And that spreads you out to your, to your Judea. Mm -hmm. And the towns where people drive in from 10 and 15 and 20 and 25 miles away, that, that spreads your circle. And you, just as much as Pastor Tyson and his wife have been plopped here by the Lord and set here in this town. You are in your town and you are in your neighborhood and you are responsible to reach people where you live and where you work. Some of you don't work in Sparta. Maybe you work in Grand Rapids. Maybe you work uh, in some other town. But you know what? You have a sphere of influence that greatly increases outside of your Jerusalem, which is Sparta, Michigan. A man like Brother Farnham is reaching your Samaria. In fact, it was Philip the Evangelist who went to Samaria. What I'm doing is expanding the influence of local churches by traveling around the countryside. I'm helping churches fulfill the Great Commission. That's how I'm helping our sending church and I'm helping other churches all over the country. And then we reach the outermost part of the earth, sending missionaries. So I want to break that down for you tonight because in your Jerusalem and in your Judea, there are bankrupt and brokenhearted and bound and blind and bruised And Jesus came to minister to them, and he sent us like he was sent. Let's look at some of them tonight. When we come to bankrupt, we mean a person who is absolutely devoid of any ability to pay. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that this five-group outline is in Luke, but the people on the lost column are all outlined for us in the Gospel of John. Nicodemus was a bankrupt man. Remember what happened when Jesus talked to Nicodemus? Jesus said, if I told you earthly things and you don't understand them, how will you, how will you believe, uh, understand if I tell you heavenly things? Nicodemus was a brilliant man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a ruler of the Jews. And yet when Jesus brought up the subject of, of eternal life, Nicodemus was clueless. How can a man be born again when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Do you see how utterly devoid of spiritual reality this man was? He was a teacher, he was a leader. And do you realize there are religious people all around us who are clueless. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely clueless. Oh, they've heard of being saved. They've heard of being born again. They've heard of, of, of you know, certain, but, but they don't understand them. And that's why Jesus, in his rendition of the Great Commission in, in Matthew's Gospel, said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Because there are people out there that you could go up and you can give them the seven verses of the Romans road and they won't have any more idea of how to be saved than they did beforehand. 
They don't have a clue about God. We're living in a what's called the postmodern era. Yeah. We're living in a time and in a culture where we, we are rearing up in our generation hundreds of millions of young people in the United States of America who don't know anything at all about God. And what they have heard is half truth or not true at all. Mm -hmm. And people need to be taught. Now, I am not saying that you cannot lead people to Christ at the door. And I am not saying that you cannot lead people to Christ after the invitation at church. I'm not saying that. I am saying we need to be clear because these people are bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Now, we assume that over time, Nicodemus finally understood. We assume that over time Nicodemus was saved because he came on the crucifixion night. We have no place where the Bible says that Jesus turned to him and said, your faith has saved you. There's no, the, the conversation never took that tone. But we do assume that Nicodemus was saved. But you know what had to happen? Jesus had to explain things to him. He was bankrupt of any kind of understanding of what it meant to be saved, to be born again. He had to have it explained to him clearly. Not only bankrupt, but what about the brokenhearted <clears throat> sinners? We've already heard tonight about the, the, uh, the Samaritan woman, also called the woman of Sychar or the woman at the well, a broken-hearted woman. Now think about her story. A woman who was now five times divorced, not rejected once, not twice, but five times. Five separate men had rejected her. And now she's given up, and she's just living with someone. Can you imagine tonight, sitting in this audience in a cushioned chair, what that woman went through every day? Can you imagine how she felt? Can you imagine how the devils of hell would torment and agonize this woman? You're worthless. Nobody loves you. You're just garbage. Listen, the devil seeks to destroy everything. I have talked in my 40 plus years of ministry to men and women who've been divorced. And every single one of them will tell you the same thing. The hardest part of it is being rejected. Mm -hmm. Psychologists will write books and tell you that the hardest human emotion to manage is rejection. I don't know if that's true because I don't know that I would have any way to measure it except to say that people that I know who are dealing with rejection seem to have the hardest time with it. It's harder to deal with rejection than it is with death. Rejection is a bitter pill. This woman had gone through it five times. And now the man she's living with doesn't even care enough about her to really call her his wife. We see not just this bankrupt Nicodemus and a broken-hearted woman at the well, but we see a man who was bound, the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. In John's Gospel, we read this story, this man who had been at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years years. Anybody here 38 years old? Willing to admit it? Anybody? <coughs> How, who's, who's close to 38? 36? 40? Anybody? Help me out here. Okay, thank you. You're not? Okay. Somebody's got to be in mid-30s to 40? Anybody? anybody? My daughter's turning 40 on Friday. Okay, all right. Sunday. You're 35. Okay. 
So here's Heather, she's 35 and, and uh, pastor's daughter is 39. Can you imagine lying in squalor for 38 years? The man is so paralyzed, he is so afflicted that every time he tries to be the first one to the water, somebody gets there ahead of him. I think he'd been there about 12 years and finally he, he kind of reared up on one elbow one day and said, hey everybody, can everybody hear me? Just listen to me. Uh, listen, I've been here for 12 years now. Would y'all give me a chance next time the angel troubles the water? Would y'all let me in? And they're all like, sure, sure, well, yeah, we'll let you. But they never did. And for 38 years, I wonder who cleaned him up every day. I wonder what that place smelled like. Think about it. Jesus walked in there and ministered to that man in his bondage. Now we know it was a chastening of some sort because after Jesus healed him, he found him in the temple and he said to that man, sin no more lest a worse thing come upon thee. I'm not sure what could be much worse than that. But Jesus ministered to this bound man. And so we see him ministering to the, bound, the, the bankrupt and the brokenhearted and the bound. And what about the blind in John chapter 9? Here's a man born blind. A man who's never seen anything. A man who's never seen a sunrise or a sunset. He never saw his mother's face. He never saw his siblings. He never saw a, an animal or a plant. He has never seen anything. Blind from his mother's womb. And there he is. Beautiful story of how Jesus gave him his sight. And the bruised. Now, in order to understand the bruise, we go back to the very first time that a bruising is mentioned in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 3, where the Bible gives us the promise that the devil would bruise the heel of the woman's seed, but the woman would bruise the head of the devil. Bruising is associated with death. And you know what? There are lost people who are absolutely beside themselves because they don't know how to deal with death. Maybe mom died, maybe dad, maybe a brother, maybe a sister, maybe a childhood friend, and they're unsaved. They have no hope. They're without God in the world. And there's, I will tell you, there are grieving, hurting people all around us. There is lost as a termite in a yo-yo. They don't have a clue. They don't understand the things we understand. They don't have the language we have. They don't, they don't use the, the little sayings. They don't talk about the will of God like we do. They don't even know God. They don't talk about blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. They don't know anything about And those are the people that Jesus came to this world to reach. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to go after these people. The spirit of the Lord is within you as a believer. And he has anointed you because just like the father sent Jesus, he sent you. But it doesn't end there because that column repeats itself within the body of Christ, within the church. There are people who are saved. They know that if they died right now, they would go to heaven. But they still fit these categories in a different way. I would call your attention tonight to the Laodicean church under the heading of bankrupt. The Laodicean church was a church. 
And nowhere in the Bible is a group of lost people ever called a church. And so because this letter in Revelation 3 was to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, everything that is said in that letter is said to believers. Mm -hmm. But listen to what Jesus says to them. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Then he says in verse 16, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind. And naked. What was wrong with the Laodicean church? The Laodicean church was worldly. The Laodicean church was wealthy. And worldliness and wealth very often go together. I didn't say always. I said very often. Worldliness in the sense that we can buy, we can throw money at everything, and we can just get and own and have and we lose that dependence upon God and we become worldly in the sense that our focus is here mm. and not there. That's why the Bible says to the church at Colossae, believers, set your affection on things above. Why would that be written if everybody who is saved automatically has a heavenly mind and a heavenly focus because we don't automatically have it. And I want to tell you that all around this area, there are people with the, the family name of Eusta. It's the biggest family in the country. In fact, the Smiths and the Joneses together aren't as big a family reunion as the Eustas. They used to go to church. They used to read the Bible. They used to pray. If you knock on their door, they'll tell you, yeah, I got saved at a Baptist camp when I was nine. Or, yeah, well, I went to a oh, I went to church until I was like 25. But they're spiritually bankrupt today. The only thing they have is Jesus. They haven't had a prayer answered in who knows how many years. They don't have the blessings of God that God pours out upon his children because they've walked away. Who knows why? I've met many people that after I listened to their profession of faith, I said, that person is as saved as I am. But his life doesn't show it. You know why? Because they have all the riches of heaven. They have the riches of glory by Christ Jesus at their disposal. But they're so dragged down by the world in which they live. They are Mark 4, 19. The cares and riches of this life and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word. There are people like that all around you that are saved, but they're absolutely bankrupt of understanding the great joy and wonder of being faithful to God. There are not just bankrupt believers around you. There are broken-hearted believers. I would refer tonight to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And there in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. You know what Paul said? He said he was cast down. Mm -hmm. Broken hearted. In fact, if you read the book of 2 Corinthians, he says that again in, uh, in chapter 4, verse 9. Persecuted but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. You realize that it's not an impossibility for a believer to be brokenhearted? No. Now, we don't have to be brokenhearted 
like the world is. We sorrow not like those who have no hope. There ought to be hope. But I will tell you that there are people who don't lay hold on eternal life. They have eternal life, but they don't lay hold on it. First, First Timothy 6, where Paul said to Timothy, Timothy's been saved for 25 or 30 years, and now Paul tells him to lay hold on eternal life. That doesn't mean, Timothy, you need to get saved. No, Timothy's already saved, and Paul is saying, Timothy, lay hold of it. Make it real in your life. And there are lots of believers within driving distance of this church who are just broken hearted. It's easy for us as the children of God to say, well, they just rebelled against the Lord. Well, maybe they did. I don't know. I wasn't there. But five and ten years down the road, as the world has beaten up on them and as the flesh has gradually taken over, you know what? They haven't lost their salvation. Because you don't lose that. No. I'll tell you what, they're broken hearted. And Jesus wants us to reach some of those people. And probably everybody in this room knows somebody like that. Maybe it's a family member. You don't win them by preaching at them. You don't win them by telling them how bad they are. Jesus was the perfect preacher, as our missionary said earlier. He was the perfect one in reaching people. You know what the Bible says about Jesus? His voice will not be heard in the streets. He will not quench the smoking flax or bruise the broken reed. That's not an exact quote, but it's a statement about Christ. I think it's in Matthew 12. You know what that means? It means he was gentle with people. Mm -hmm. He was gentle. He said, I'm meek and lowly in heart. Jesus didn't grab people by the scruff of the neck. Mm -hmm. and to, You know what? The woman who was taken in adultery in the very act, he didn't grab her up by her dress and say, you wretched, wicked woman, get out of here. I'll talk to you outside. You are defiling this place. Mm. But you know, that's how we treat some of our former church members. Mm -hmm. Jesus called us to minister to them. I've had a certain amount of challenge as I've watched my children become adults and as I have watched them struggle to make their dad and mom's faith their own faith. And they haven't done everything right. And I haven't been able to help them by yelling at them. I have been able to help them by loving them. There's some broken-hearted and, 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 and bound, uh, bound people in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, we, we read some very interesting verses where Paul says, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, Though we walk in the flesh, meaning we, we walk around in a body of flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strong holds. That is, there are things in people's lives that have a hold upon them. So strong, <coughs> they can't seem to get out of it. I want to I wanna ask you, do you know anybody with a bad habit? We had a man in our church, and the story is precious. I was sitting in my office in July of 2000, working on some messages, and a man just walked in the front door of the church. Never seen him before in my life. Came in, sat down in my office, put his head in his hands, and began to sob. And after about five minutes, he regained his composure enough to tell me, I'm a hopeless drunk. 
My wife and kids are leaving me. I'm going to lose everything. Can you help me? Well, I gave him a 10-step program and sent him on his way. No, I didn't. I gave him the gospel. Amen. You know what he said to me? He said, yeah, my mother's been telling me that all my life. And he got up and walked out of my office. Mm -hmm. A month later, he came back. Same thing, rerun. Sobbing, brokenhearted. You know what I did? Yeah, you know what I did. I gave him the gospel again. And you know what he did? He got up again and walked out. But the next Sunday, he was in church. And guess what? Everything about him was different. He walked up to me. He said, Pastor, I made it about halfway home the other day when I stopped. He said, I was crying so hard I couldn't see. I thought I was going to have a wreck if I didn't pull the car over. He said, I pulled the car over on the side of Route 9 and asked God to save me. And he said, he did. He said, I went home and he said, I gathered all the beer cans and opened them up and dumped them down the drain. My wife came in, what in the world are you doing? He said, never mind, I'll explain it later. He said, I went to the liquor cabinet. I got out every bottle of liquor and dumped it down the drain. And he said, I'm gonna tell you something. I am never gonna touch liquor again. Amen. And you know, this is 2022, 22 years later, and he's never touched a drop of liquor. He began to grow, got baptized, joined the church, began to grow. No encouragement from his wife. We prayed for her to be saved, and to this day, I don't think she is saved. But he grew and stood for God. And then I began to notice a trend. Every once in a while, he'd come to the altar after a message, and I could see him weeping at the altar. Oh, what's going on? What's going on with me? So I took him out to breakfast one day. I said, I said, I'm not trying to pry. I said, what's going on? He hung his head in shame. He said, Pastor, I don't know how to tell you this. He said, the day I got saved, I dumped out my liquor and I've never been tempted to touch another drop. But he said, preacher, I can't shake the tobacco. He said, it has a hold on me. I can't. I give it up for a day or two, and I, I just can't. He said, I'm so ashamed to tell you that. You must be so disappointed in me. I said, no. I said, I'm not disappointed. But let's just pray about it. And I said, let's keep praying, and let's keep praying. And you know what? The day came when he walked into the office after a revival service. He said, I just want you to know, I didn't tell you when this first happened because I didn't know if it was real or not. But he said, it's been six months since I've had a cigarette. He said, God has delivered me. Amen. I had breakfast with that good man just a few weeks ago when I was home. And he told me that story again. He said, what a deliverance. What a deliverance it was. I want to tell you, you know people that are bound. Mm -hmm. And it's not just alcohol and tobacco. Listen, we live in a country, and I want to be very careful, but we live in a country of bondages. Mm -hmm. People bound to legal drugs, opioids. People in bondage to all kinds of eating disorders. People in bondage to pornography. People in bondage. The devil cannot possess you when you're saved. But he sure knows how to oppress you. And he sure knows how to depress you. There is deliverance. But it doesn't come by screaming it. And God wants us to minister to those people and reach out to them and help them. You see, there are people who are bankrupt and blind and or, or, or 
brokenhearted and bound. What about blind? Well, we've already looked at the Laodicean church and one of the things God said about them was they were blind. And you know there are people in the church who are blind to the very truths that would make them free. You remember what Jesus said? You'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Do you realize how very little moral truth is being taught in the United States of America today? Yeah. You realize how, how pastors, and, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna relate from my own. We we almost feel hand handcuffed and, and tied. You dare not say anything because maybe that visitor is shacked up and they'll leave the church and, and slander you all over town. You, you don't know what to say about morals anymore. You don't know what to say about girls being ladies and being virgins when they get married. You don't even know what to say about it. You don't know what to say about young men and how they ought to be virgins when they get married. Because, preacher, nobody's doing that anymore. What planet are you from? I ain't ever coming back to this church. You realize what a warped culture yeah. we live in? People are blind to the fact that four words, thou, or five, thou shalt not commit adultery. Those five words would end unwanted pregnancies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 98% of all abortions would never occur. Five words. People are blind to it. They think you're a legalist if you say anything. They're blind to a truth that would absolutely make them free. People that are married and they're, they're in bondage to pornography, they're blind to what is absolutely destroying them and their marriage. The truth that would make them free. You know, a lot of people are blind to the truth of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. They think that's for preachers and missionaries. No, it's for everybody that sits in the pew, too. And I will guarantee that brokenheartedness and bondage and blindness and bruising and bankruptcy don't occur in the lives of Holy Spirit-filled people. The Thessalonian church was bruised. And Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning the ones that have died. I found an interesting verse in the Bible. And I want to, I want to take you there where, where our text is here in Luke. But let's go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, verse 2. The Bible says, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial. Now notice this. And made great lamentation over him. I thought as believers, we weren't supposed to sorrow like the world does. Great lamentation sounds pretty serious. You know why they made great lamentation? Because 1 Thessalonians had not yet been written. And 1 Corinthians 15 mm -hmm. had not yet been written. They didn't understand what we understand with a completed Bible. Huh? Sure. When, you find, when you find the story of, of Dorcas in the book of Acts, the Bible says that the women were weeping showing Peter the garments that she had made for them. While she, and, and they were just, they were beside themselves. Because they didn't know. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. I don't want you to sorrow like those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so that sleep in him will he bring with him. 
And this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain will not prevent them which are asleep in soul. Glory. And then when he says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. That was new revelation. Nobody had known that before. You know, there's some people that you know that are just about done in by a death. I won't give the details because it is still so very, very fresh. But I have a family that are friends of mine. They have a number of children, all adults now. And um, their youngest daughter in that family got married to a boy in another family. You have to say that the daughter married a boy. You have to kind of say that today, you know, so people know what's going on. <laughs> it's an interesting and rather intertwined situation because two of her sisters, one of her sisters married the brother of her husband and the other one married the cousin of her husband and they're all attending the same church. Father's Day morning, this young man who had been married for seven months stabbed his wife and then blew his brains out. Wow. I got word of this situation and my mother committed suicide a number of years ago and God's used that in my life so that I can help some other people. And I had a free Sunday and I went and tried to minister to that family. Can you wrap your head around the sorrow? Mm -hmm. That young man, 22 years old, his widow, his brothers and sisters and cousins, his aunts and uncles, his dad and mom and grandmother were all sitting in that audience on that Sunday. Talk about a grieving church. Talk about a challenge for that pastor. God used that day to help, help those people. Listen, their grief is not over. Father's Day is two and a half months ago. Their grieving is going to last a long time. Yeah. You know that after you go to a funeral for your friend's mom or your friend's husband, your life comes back to normal pretty quick. But that person's life never returns to normal. They have to find a new normal. Hmm? There are all kinds of people. And whether we are missionaries to Sparta, or whether we're missionaries to the, the Judea that is around us, where we work and where we do our shopping and where we, where we mingle with family that's gotten married and moved out here and moved out there, or whether you travel on a vacation and go 500 miles away, or whether you are sending somebody else there, like an evangelist. I don't know if your church supports evangelists. I don't know, and I'm not asking that. I'm just saying, maybe you do. Maybe you support missionaries. I'm sure you do in the foreign field. But I want you to know, every one of those missionaries and every evangelist and your pastor and his wife minister to blind and bankrupt and brokenhearted and bound and bruised people every day. And those are the people that everyone in this room is called to reach. Everybody in this room is called to reach them. And sometimes it ends up being one of our own. Sometimes it's someone in the church. It's not our business to look down our long bony noses and condemn people. It is our business to minister mm -hmm. to them. It is not our business to embarrass them. To say in a loud voice in the lobby, well, we haven't seen you for a month of Sundays. <laughs> they know that.
They know that. It's our business to minister to them. To find ways to shed the love of God that is in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. To shed that love to them. It is our business to find ways to hold them up when they're broken hearted. It is our business to find ways to shed light to, so that they won't be blind. It is our business to give truth that will make them free. Now, they may reject it, but they might accept it. I guarantee they can't accept truth that you never give them. It's good. And they can't reject truth that you never give them. And what they do with it is their business. But what you do with it is your business. And the way you minister to people is on your account. And the older I get, I don't know how this is with you, Brother Tyson. But you're older than I am, so it must be really weighing on you. <laughs> what, six months older or something? March is your birthday? Seven months, man. <clears throat> I don't know how it is with you, but as I get closer to heaven, I think more about that moment when I'm going to stand in front of Jesus face to face. Yeah. Hmm? I can think of some people that I didn't ever help in my effort to help them, I actually hurt them. But I can think of some other people that I did help, but they didn't receive it. But thank God, there are people out there that I have helped, and they've received it. Mm -hmm. Do not let the chance that someone won't appreciate you stop you from reaching out this week and next week, and every week that is left in 2022, and every week that is left to you on this planet, do not let the chance that someone may not appreciate it keep you from finding some bankrupt and brokenhearted and bound and blind and bruised people and minister to them. Find out what they need, not, not what they want to make themselves feel cozy, what they need. Mm -hmm. Get on your knees and pray for them. Amen. Make somebody your prayer project. You don't have to tell them, just do it. Mm -hmm. And ask God, Lord, how can I? Show me what to do. Show me when to do it. Show me how to do it. We're so wrapped up in ourselves. It's true. I understand. I know what it's like to raise five kids and homeschool them and pastor a church at the same time. We did that for 22 years. I figured it out after we graduated our last one. I, I did the lesson planning. I wrote out 58,500 lesson plans in 22 years. Yeah. I tell people homeschooling is work, but it's only half the work of undoing the damage of the public school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, folks, there are people who need you. And God's put you here for them. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. And he has anointed you. So let's go after those five groups of people. Not just this week, but every week for the rest of your life. Let's stand tonight with our heads bowed. I'm going to ask our pianist to use the song, Rescue the Perishing. I believe that this altar call is for everybody in this room tonight. Because all of us, right now, every person in this room right now, is thinking of somebody. And you're thinking, that's the person God's put on my heart with this message. Or maybe you're thinking of a family. And I want to invite people. Now, I, I understand. I understand some people don't come to the front and kneel. 
But I want to invite everybody that can to come and make an altar tonight. And if you can't come up here and eat, I get that. I'm not, I'm not going to be, you know, thinking you're unspiritual. But maybe you just need to sit down in your chair right where you are and cry out to God tonight. Because there's somebody on your heart and God wants you to reach that person. And God wants you to work with that family. And God wants you to go rescue some perishing soul. Somebody that's bound or blind or broken hearted or bruised or bankrupt. God wants you to reach those people. You can. You can make a difference. It's not, you don't have to be ordained to the ministry to make a difference. And I'm asking you tonight to make an altar. And be a missionary. Be a missionary to your Jerusalem, your Judea. And be a missionary in helping those that are going to Samaria and the other most part of the earth where you and I can't go. Five thirty-nine. If you need the words, let's sing it out together tonight. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus. Sing it out. Rest.